So this is further stats one from 2021. So the first question then, expected frequency for these things is 43, 43, 43, 43, 43. 43 times four is that, which means that's how many rolls there are, which means if we just do that, take away these three, we're gonna get 55, which is what X needs to be. Uh, testing at 5% significance, whether or not there's evidence this is biased or not. Uh, three degrees of freedom because there are four columns and there's one restriction, which is they must add up to 150, uh, sorry, 172. Uh, so therefore, 4 minus 1 gives us 3 degrees of freedom. Hypothesis is H1 is that it's unbiased. H, uh, sorry, H0 is that it's unbiased. H1 is that it's going to be biased. And then we can test this, right? We can say, here's the expected column. I'll, I'll do this to work out my x squared, because this is just what I prefer to do. So it'll be this squared over this, plus this squared over this, plus this squared over this, plus this squared over this. Uh, none of these things are below 5, so I'm okay to just not collapse any columns here, which we would have talked about here anyway. I take away 172 because that's what n is, and so we'll get this. I look up in the tables uh, for v3, uh, 0 0.05 for 5 cents of so that's that one there. And our number is less than that, so we're not in the critical region, and so we're not going to reject h0. And that's the first question done. Question two then, uh, we receive calls randomly at this rate, so this is going to be about Poisson because it's about a number of things that happen per time. A uh, 30 minute period is three times longer than this. So if we times this by three, we'll get 3.75. And that's the lambda we'll run with our Poisson. We're looking for exactly two, sorry, we're looking for at least two calls. That's probability of greater than or equal to two, which is the same as one minus the probability of less than or equal to one. Just use a calculator, uh, Poisson, commutative distribution, you get some numbers, you get this. Calculate probably at least two of these calls uh, in, uh, are received by the garage in four out of six random sectors weekends. So this is sort of a binomial question within a Poisson question. So we've got six randomly selected periods. Uh, each one has a probability of this, of getting at least two calls, and we want to know uh, what the probability of getting fewer than four is. So probability of x less than four, if we have this distribution now, and, uh, and we'll just get, uh, of course, this is less than or equal to three, which now means we can use the binomial commutative distribution thing, and we'll get this here in the calculator. Uh, apologies for being lazy and just using x lots of times. Technically, I shouldn't have done that, but I don't really care. The measure of the garage randomly selects 150 non-overlapping periods, and uh, we want to record the number of calls, and we want to test whether uh, a proximal expression to show something, uh, finding at least three calls in the 30-minute periods were exactly eight. So first, we need to work out what the probability of getting exactly eight calls is in a 30-minute period. Uh, so probability that we get exactly eight in this distribution here, because we're still talking about 30-minute periods, well, that's that, which is a very low number. And we want in... Um, in, in at least three of these periods out of 150. Now, we're, we're gonna use a binomial here, of course, where we have 150 with this as the probability, but it says a Poisson approximation. So we're gonna use a Poisson distribution instead, whereby um, Poisson is gonna be n times p as our thing. So this times this is that, and we'll use a Poisson distribution for our approximation rather than doing it properly with a binomial. Um, so binomial says 150 30 minute periods with the, this probability for each of them, because that was the probability of x being exactly eight. Uh, from this Poisson thing, but now we're going to estimate this with a new Poisson of this, and we're going to look for the probability of getting at least three of these. So greater than each of three, which is the same as one minus less than equal to two. Uh, put that in the calculator, and uh, we'll get this, which is this. And, uh, and that's what it says there. Explain why the Poisson approximation might not be reasonable, uh, or may be reasonable. It may be reasonable because n is very large, the number of calls you're receiving is large, and the probability of them having uh, of having eight of them is very small. Use context when you're doing this. Don't just say n large, p small. Um, throw in some context. So number of calls and probability of receiving eight of them. You know, throw in some context to make sure you get the mark. The manager of the garage decides where to test uh, the number of calls is different on a Saturday to other days. Uh, so she selects a, a Saturday random and, and uses four hours now. So 10 times six gets us to an hour and then times four gets us to four hours. So it's going to be this times four times six, which is 30. So now we're going to do a Poisson distribution with lambda is 30. So H0, I guess, is just lambda stays at 30. And H1 is lambda isn't 30, because we're talking about a change, not a decrease or increase. I think it just says uh, she wants to test whether it's it's different. Yeah, different. So we'll use not equals to. Uh, and now we, we find there have been 40 telephone calls. Um, so what we do is we get out this Poisson distribution here, and we look for the probability of receiving more than uh, or equal to 40, which is the same as obviously 1 minus less than or equal to 39. Uh, put that in the calculator. Poisson cumulative frequent uh, distribution thing. We get this, which is this, which is uh, less than or equal to zero points. Oh, but of course, like I said, it's a two-tailed test, right? Because um, this is not equal to 30. So we're not just testing below or above. So we split this 5% into 2.5 either end. 
and, and this is greater than 0 0.025. And so therefore, we it, it's not in the critical region and we do not reject H0. And that would be that done. Excellent. Uh, and, and then maybe again, throw in some context, just like we did here, just say no evidence of the number of course changes on a Saturday as opposed to other days. Maybe I should have added them as well. Just put in as much context as you can, I think is probably a good idea. Uh, so this is the central limit theorem question. I think we've got a binomial here and we're going to estimate the probability that a, a sample has changed. So the sample is 100 big. Um, so what we're going to do is, is firstly we need to work out NP, which is this times this. That will be the mu for our normal distribution. And then our variance will be NP1 minus P, uh, which will be this. Just again, just plugging those numbers in. And so we're going to have a um, normal distribution of NP here and then the variance squared over 100, because there are 100 things. And that's just what you do when you have a sample and you're using central limit theorem. So, okay, what we need to do is we're looking for the probability of being greater than uh, 257, which is, of course, the same as 1 minus the probability of being less than 257. Uh, remember, when you put this into your normal, you need to square root all of this, because that's the variance, not the standard deviation. So we need to square root this. So put it in the normal uh, calculator function. And, uh, and you get this about eventually, and then you get this. Sometimes I like just writing lots of decimal places because I'm bored. Anyway, question number four is about uh, a photography group, and, and this is how many uh, entrants to their competition they get. So uh, there's a probability A that someone will enter no photos, probability 0 0.2, someone will enter one photo, all the way up to five. You're not allowed to enter more than five. Uh, given expected value of this is this. Uh, so what we can do is we can say, well, what's 4n plus 2? Well, 4 times 0 plus 2 is 2, 4 times 1 plus 2 is 6, and so on. And now expected value of this is just going to be 2 times a plus 6 times this plus 10 times this plus this times this. So you got all that done, and that apparently equals 14.8. You can simplify it up, you get this. Uh, of course, these are all probabilities, so they must just add up to 1, um, and we get this. You can probably see where this is going. My third equation is going to come from here. Probability that n equals 5 given n is greater than 2. So these are the probabilities that n is greater than 2, and the probability that n is 5 is just this one. So c over all of this is equal to a half, uh, which we can cross multiply out, we can rearrange. And now I just put this, this, and this in the simultaneous equations solve function of my calculator, and it gave me these figures out here. Show that variance is this, uh, so we're going to keep on going with this question. Variance is e of x squared minus e of x all squared, or n in this case, since we're using n here. Uh, of course, we know e of n, do we? Yeah, we do. It's the, no, we don't, because we used these numbers before. So, okay, we have to work out E of n. So it's 0 times this, plus 1 times this, plus this, and so on. We know A, B, and C, of course, so we can just put those in. I've written them as decimals when I needed them, but that's okay. We get this. E of n squared, uh, so we just do 0 squared times A, plus 1 squared times 0 0.2, plus 2 squared times this. We get this eventually. And so the variance is going to be this, take away this squared, which I think gives us what we wanted to get. Uh, they charge 50p for entry for the first photograph and then 20 thereafter for a maximum pound. So it goes 50, 70 pence if you enter one, 90 pence if you enter two. Okay, is that right? Sorry. Z it costs zero to enter zero photos. So zero, 50 pence for one, 70 pence for two, 90 pence for three, and then one pound for four or five. Um, and so I'll put that up there. And all we have to do here is work out the expected um, entry fee. So it's just this times this, which is that plus this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this, and so on. And that'll give me the answer in pence, and I'll maybe just um, keep it in pence, I don't care. Okay. Uh, suggest, uh, as, as the mean and variance are close, a Poisson distribution could be used. The problem with using a Poisson distribution is that there's a maximum entry of five photographs, and a Poisson would just continue thinking there's more probability to get six, seven, or eight, and so on. And so it wouldn't be a great model because it doesn't allow you to just cut off at a maximum amount. So that would be probably a drawback. Uh, five, question five then, so we've got large number of counters, they all have different bags with different numbers of red and white, but we'll start with Asha, who has a um, probability getting red counter of 0 0.07, and she wants to draw, or she find the probability of drawing at least three before a red is drawn. Well, that's literally just going to be, the probability of drawing a, uh, a white is 0 0.93, so it's just going to be 0 0.93 times 0 0.93 times 0 0.93. You just need three of these first, and then you don't care what happens after that, you just want three of those, which is this. Find the property you get to red counter the second time on the ninth draw. Now, this is a bit more involved. What we need to do is work out in the first eight draws, she must have got one. So somewhere in the first eight draws, she got one red counter. And that the probability of that is eight choose one, because it could be any one of those eight draws, times the probability of getting one counter, which is 0 0.07, times the probability of getting seven white ones. So it's just a little binomial here. 
And then on the ninth row, she has to get a red, which is this. So we times by that, and we get this number here. The property of Davina, sorry, Davinda, getting a red counter is P. Uh, she draws until she gets N red counters. Now that's a negative binomial distribution. So I'm immediately opening up the formula book and having a look down here because this could be helpful. And then of course it will be. The mean is given by this. So therefore we know R over P is that. And we know R into 1 minus P over P squared is that. Um, now, do we have any information here at all? Well, we know P is P, but R is given as N. So I'll just replace that with N. And uh, and yeah, we know this. So we're going to just times by P here, shove it into here. Uh, times by P squared. I've actually just squared this out. Uh, of course, I should try to be careful. Standard deviation is variance. Um, st is um, Standard deviation is the square root of the variance, right? So if standard deviation is this, I just need to, uh, and that's the variance, I need to square root that to get the standard deviation. Or I could just square the standard deviation, uh, and, and that will equal that. It, it's kind of up to you, but this this is this will work eventually. Um, of course, we, we expand out, we, we simplify, we can cancel out some p's because p isn't zero. And we get this, uh, so that's the value of P there. Jerry believes that his bag contains a smaller proportion of red counters than Ash's. To test this belief, he draws until he gets a red. Now, that's a geometric idea, geometric distribution, if you draw until you get a single one. Uh, say your hypothesis clearly. So we'll start maybe with um, the idea that H0 is just that he has the same probability as Asher, which is 0 0.07. And H1 is that he has a smaller one because he's testing his belief is that he has, he has a smaller proportion. So that would be H1. And now this is, like I said, it's just a geometric portion with 0 0.07. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to work out, um, we want the probability of J being greater than or equal to some number J being less than 0 0.1. So we want to draw, we want this number to be big enough such that the probability of drawing until that point is less than 0 0.1. So it needs to be a really big number until we have a really low probability of actually getting that far. Now, the probability of bit greater than or equal to in a geometric is not given here. It's given by this. Essentially, all this is saying is you just need a load of the other one in a row before you get to the one you actually want. Um, so it's almost like, you know, if, if you, it's what we did at the start actually here. If you want to avoid having a, if you want to get, if you want to avoid having a white count, a red counter until like the fourth draw, you just times lots of white counters together. So you just times lots of the other probability um, down, to, down to this here. So yeah, so we just put that into there. Uh, of course, P is 0 0.07 in the, in the test. So we get this. Uh, we can take log of both sides. Be careful. When you take log of a number like this, you're going to have to flip the sign. Um, so we flip the sign here. Uh, of course, if we didn't, this wouldn't make so much sense when we have a critical region of less than 33. That doesn't really make any sense. So we want J. Our critical region is, is anything above or equal to 33. If we have to wait for as long as 33, then we're going to say to a 10% level of significance that our probability is less than 0 0.07, um, which is, of course, what the next question says. Um, he says he gets it on the 34, that's in the critical region. And again, just throw in some context. Within the critical region, there is evidence that his back has a smaller proportion of reds, maybe I should have said, than ashes. Um, so yeah, as much context as you put in there. Given the probability of Jerry getting a red is this, show that the power of the test is this. Now the power of a test is uh, the idea that, or the probability that you reject H0 when H0 is false, which is what you want, right? You want to reject it when it's not true. Now what's the probability of this? Well, the probability of rejecting H0 um, to reject H0, we need to be bigger than or equal to 33, uh, according to this uh, critical region we found before. But H0 is false, so we're not following the geometric sequence we did before. We're following this new one. There should be a new another closed bracket here, but it doesn't really matter. We're following this one with probability of that. Um, so what's the probability of being 33 or above, given this one here? Um, well, again, we just used the same formula we did two minutes ago, but this time we plug in 33, um, which gives us this. Uh, given this distribution that we're now working with, and we get this as our power, and uh, and that's equal to that. Three, I should have written underneath here equal to seven zero two brackets three SF, but I couldn't be bothered. So now we get to the probability generating function question. Every single time you do this question, you need gx of one is equal to one. You put that in, and you can solve for k, and you get k as this very quickly. So that's good. P of x equals two. Um, in a probability generating function, the probability of x equaling a number is the equal to the coefficient of t to the power of that number. So this is the equal to the coefficient of t squared. Now, if I expand that out, doing a very quick binomial, k is 1 over 2, 4, 3. And then I very quickly binomial this. I couldn't even be bothered to get past this point here. So the first time is obviously 1. Then it's 1 to the 4 times 2t times 5 choose 1. 5 choose 1 is 5 times 2 is 10. And the next one is 1 to the power of 3 times this squared, which is 4t squared. 
times 5 to 2, which is 10. So you get 40 t squared. And I'll stop there just because the coefficient of t squared is 40 over 2, 4, 3. Probability general function of this finds the probability general function. There's a really easy um, rule here, which is this here. So you take this number and you shove it into this t, t to the power of this. And then you just take the original function you had um, and you put this two there. So this one goes there, this one goes in there. And then, of course, we can just use this function here. Uh, so k is still that. You put a t cubed at the front and then you replace this t with a t squared and you get this. You can simplify it a bit more if you want to and you get that. We have a different probability generating function here. Given they're independent, uh, find the probability uh, uh, generating function of this. This is in the formula book. If you make a new generating function out of two other ones added together, then that new generating function is just the other two times together. So the g u of t is just going to be this one times this one, uh, like I've said here. So this original one times this one here. These two just go together to make 1 plus t to, 2 t to the power 7. The t comes out front. This times by this is that, and we'll get this here. Use calculus to find this. This is in the book as well. There it is. Variance is this here. So I need to find g dash of u because we're doing variance of u, then she finds g double dashed of u, and I need to evaluate all those things at one and put it in the formula. Um, so I don't think I actually need that. That was just, I should have deleted that and going to a new page. So this is the function here. g dashed of that, it's a bit of product rule, right? Differentiate this t first for a one and leave this one alone, and then leave that one alone, differentiate this function, which the seven comes out the front, the differ differential of this is two, so that makes a 14 in the front, leave this alone, and then lower that power, you get this. And then for the second derivative, we have to do differential of that is just bring the 7 out, bring the 2 out, that makes a 14, lower that to a 6. And then here, differentiate that t, another product rule here, differentiate that two, t, it goes away, differentiate this one while keeping this one here. 6 comes out the front, 2 comes out the front, 14 times 6 times 2 is this, and then this gets lowered down to a 5. Substitute in 1 into these things, and you get this. Substitute in 1 into that, you get this, I believe, I hope so at least. And then we have uh, variance is this one minus, or sorry, plus this one, minus this one squared, and uh, we'll have our answer there. Question number seven, then. We're making lollipop sticks, mean mu, standard deviation point two, and uh, we believe the mean might be different, so he's doing a hypothesis test here, checking mu is less than 15 or not, 1% significance. Sample size n. The size of the test is just 0 0.01, because the size of the test is probably rejecting H0 when, H, when it's true, uh, and, and of course, that's just the size of the uh, critical interval that you'd be in, which is 0 0.01, because that's 1% of the significance. Okay, given this, uh, calculate the probability type error. There's lots to do here, but we'll first start with the sample bit. Now, given that it's a sample, that means the mean of the sample is normal, just normally distributed uh, with mean 15, because we'll just start with h naught, and, and then we've got 0 0.2 over n, or squared. So 0 0.2 is standard deviation, so we just square it, and then we divide by n. Again, this is just from central limit theorem, as we saw earlier. Now, what I want to do first is I want to look for the critical region for this test here. So to do that, I'm just going to standardize it. So I'm going to call the critical value k. So under k, and I would reject h naught, and over k, and I would accept it. So if I just standardize that by taking away 15, and then this you could write as 0 0.2 over root n, all squared. So that would be the standard deviation I'll put there. Um, I want this to be um, have a 1% chance of happening, because I want to be on the critical value. That's what I'm trying to find first. So we'll do, um, you can use tables if you want to, or a calculator, look for the inverse normal using area 0 0.01 and just do the standardized normal thing, you get this. And therefore we can times this out and add 15 and we get this here. And this is the value of K for which is borderline reject H0, accept H0. So if we're below this, I'll reject H0. And if we are above this, I would accept it. Um, notice how we're taking away something from 15. So it's it's below 15, which is good. So this is our this is our critical value below below 15 uh, that would be the borderline being between accepting and rejecting. Um, have a think about this just for just a second. Like if n was 1, k would be like 14 point, you know, 6 or something, um, which is quite a long way from 15, especially, especially considering the actual value of mu is 14.9. Like if n was 1, k was 14.6, which means we'd accept something like 14.7, because that's bigger than k. But if it was 14.7, it would be much more likely that this was happening than this. And that's what this next bit is talking about. A type 2 error is the probability of accepting h naught, even though h naught is false. So we want to know for what n, essentially, uh, it's asking us, and sort of following from that, for what n and therefore for what k, critical value, um, can we minimize the probability of accepting h naught, even if this was actually true? 
And think this through maybe a little bit logically. If we increase n, that would do, be a really good job. Like if we made n 100, root, n, root 100 is 10, divide this by 10 to get 0 0.05 or something around there, and we get 14.95 here, which would put us between these two things, right? And so the critical value, like we'd accept 14.95, and, and it would seem probably equally likely that we were in this case or this case, which again is, is better, but not what we want. We want to decrease the likelihood of accepting H naught, even if it's wrong, as far as possible. So we're going to want N to be even bigger than that. We want to, we're going to want our K value to be really nice and close to 15, like 14.99 or whatever, um, to make the probability of, of um, accepting H naught, even if this was happening, to be very small. And so okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this critical value here and we're essentially going to do this thing again. We're going to standardize this whole k value here, but this time we're going to standardize it under this normal distribution because this is the one that is apparently correct. If we've got a type 2 error, then this is correct. So we're going to standardize this k. I'm going to throw this value into here in a second, but for now I'm just going to write k. We're going to put this value into here and we're looking for that to be, uh, for, for us to have a very small chance of this happening, right? So what we can do is we can do an inverse normal area of 0.95, uh, standard normal distribution. And this is the value on the standard normal distribution for which 95% uh, of the area is beneath it. And so only 5% is above it. And essentially, we want to be in that 5%, right? We want this, this type 2 error probability to be so small that we want to be above this value on the standard normal distribution and to be in that, in that less than 5% likelihood area. Um, and so that's why I've set this up here. And now, of course, we can replace this k with this value here, times everything by this denominator here, and we end up with this. So I've just put this k value in there to get this thing here, and then move this over to there. And we get this. And, and from here, it's a very simple solve. You add this to both sides, and that just increases this number because this is kind of the same term. This take this as 0.1. Do this divided by 0.1, and then square everything, and you end up with n. Uh, is bigger than this, or, or yeah, multiply this by both sides, then divide by 0 0.1 and, and then square everything. And you end up with n is bigger than that, which means n has to be 64 is the minimum number, which tracks with what we were saying earlier, where we want to try and make n really, really big um, to then try and send k as close to this 15 as possible to minimize this type 2 error. Um, after that, uh, just for the last mark, uh, we use the same sample size, but now carry out a 5% test. Uh, how would this affect the probability of type 2 error? So this is a different way of changing this probability here. If we're doing a 5% test, then the probability of accepting H0 is reduced because the size of the test would be bigger. It would be 0 0.05. And so more tests would fall into the 0 0.05 region. And so H0, the chance of accepting H0 would be decreased. Now, if the chance of accepting H0 is decreased, that decreases the type chance of a type 2 error because the type 2 error is the chance of accepting H0 but H0 is false. If the chances of accepting H0 are lesser, then this entire thing decreases as well. And so that's the other way to decrease the likelihood of a type 2 error, I guess. And you just need to say the words, which decrease. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.